I invite your attention tonight to the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth, chapter 2. We've looked at the sin of unbelief on Sunday, and last night we looked at our continual need of grace. And tonight I take you to the book of Ruth, and we pray the Lord will bless the Word of God as we try to look at this subject matter that's found in here on the gracious words of the blessed Redeemer. Let's all stand as we read God's Word and honor the Word of God. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them, have, not I, have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And he let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field unto even and beat out that she had gleaned and it was about an ephath of barley. You may be seated. Tonight I preach from this text on the gracious words of the blessed Redeemer. The book of Ruth is a wonderful story of the redemption in midst of great tragedy. I think of the book as the romance of redeeming grace, if you will. And throughout this account we see the love behind our redemption. It's very interesting as you study the Old Testament that nowhere else in the Old Testament is love connected with redemption like it is here in the book of Ruth. As a matter of fact, what you read in the book of Ruth, you don't read about the sacrificial nature of redemption. You don't, you don't, you don't read about a bloody sacrifice in redemption. That is given earlier in the law of God of sacrifice. But here you have developed before us the tenderness of the heart of God expressing His love as the outflow of the redemptive work that is laid out in this book. It is the book, if you will, of the romance of redeeming grace. It is, the, in other words, it is the love behind our redemption. 
In Ruth chapter 1 and Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 through 6, you find the need of redeeming grace. And there you have uh, some defective decisions. Uh, uh, Naomi's husband uh, leaves the place of blessing. He leaves the house of bread. Uh, he doesn't trust in the living God. He goes down to Moab. And because of that decision that he made, that decision that he made, he finds that he dies his, and, uh, and all that is left to him, uh, left to, to Naomi and that family is graves. And that teaches us that there are consequences to our sins. And so we find graves in chapter 1 as the consequences of of the defective decisions of those men that are mentioned there. You have the defective decisions, you have desperate circumstances, you have a depraved nativity there in chapter 1 because Ruth and, uh, and, and Ruth and Orpah are, uh, they are um, in Moab, they're the natives of Moab, and they're under a curse. God has cursed them, I don't have time to develop that tonight, but God has placed the, the, those that are in Moab under a curse, and there is no way out from that curse except the way the Lord's going to deliver them in the book of Ruth. In Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 through 22, you find the road to redeeming way, uh, grace, or the way out. You know, people, there, are, there is a way out of our defective decisions and desperate circumstances and our depraved nativity. There is a way out of the way we were born. There's a way out of our sin. And that is also developed in this book on the road to redeeming grace. God had provided it. He had access to it. And this lady by the name of Ruth obtains redeeming grace that way. And then you also, in chapter 1, have the effect of redeeming grace. It affected Ruth. It also affected Naomi, and she was restored. You know, it is grace that delivers us initially. It is grace that continually delivers us. And so Naomi is restored in this book. Not only is Ruth, not only does Ruth come to know the God of all grace, but Naomi is restored to a place of blessing through the same Redeemer. And so whether it's restoration that a person needs who has gone away from the true and living God uh, or whether it is uh, new salvation, the beginning of salvation, as in the case of this Gentile woman here, God has the supply of grace that is needed. And when we come to chapter 2, we have Ruth entering into what I like to call the field of grace. Over in Moab, everything is death. Everything is death and dying. All you have in Moab are graves. You have a great famine that's going on there. Uh, that is a famine of soul. There is no way out. There is no way of return. Uh, if, they, if she stays there, she'll have her gods and she'll die in her sin. And she comes back to a time in the text, a time when the barley fields are full. The, there, it's harvest time, and so all around them is the gracious provision of the God of heaven. Everywhere you look, there in Bethlehem, on the hillsides in that hill country, the Bible teaches us, now I don't know how Bethlehem looks today, it really doesn't matter to me how rocky it may be today, the fact is this text teaches me right here that in this day, and we're talking about, you know, some uh, 3,300 years ago, and scenery changes, places change. So 3,300 years ago, we find in our text about this wonderful place, the, bed, the bread basket, if you will, of the nation of Israel in that day, and I think it's still the bread basket of the nation of Israel, but anyway, be that as it is, in this day, you have all these fields all around full of God's provision. God's grace is given to them. I like to think of Ruth a waist high or maybe breast high, if you will, walking through the barley fields. And those barley fields are everywhere. And they have the man going in there with the sickle and they're going in and cutting the, the barley down and they're putting it into sheaves and they're taking it up to be harvested out and to be beat out so they can make their bread. And this is where we find Ruth in this text. She has come to the place of grace. And she's going to get some grace like she could have never have imagined. And what you'll find in chapter 2, what also interests me about chapter 2, is what happens in chapter 2 happens in one day. It does not a long period of time. Now, she'll stay in the field of grace all through the barley season, all through the wheat season. She'll stay through both seasons. She'll tell, take to all the harvest is finished. See, barley's first, wheat's later. But anyway, everything of God's provision will be there, and she'll stay to the very end. But all that happens in chapter 2 
happens in one day. In this day that I'm talking about, she finds some words from her blessed Redeemer. We, we broke into the passage of chapter 2 uh, in verse 8, and we look at it now. Now, before, we, before, before us, we have the gracious words of the blessed Redeemer. Ruth is in the field of grace, and the text says that she just happed on it. That means that she just happened to get there. You know, as we look at things, things just happen, and that's the way the writer is writing it. Uh, of course, God, God behind this, he's working things out for his pleasure and good, for the good of Ruth, but it just looks like these things just happen to, you know, come along, as the text would say earlier in the text. And in this one day, in, in this place, Ruth's whole life is changed. She'll remain in this place the whole harvest season, and in this place she'll be carefully and consistently and continually provided for. In this place she'll learn about her Redeemer. She'll, work, she'll learn as she stays there that the words of her Redeemer are true. Now she doesn't know that as she begins this journey. She hears, she sees... She, she experiences Boaz, who is her Redeemer, which is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. She feels this, she experiences this in this day, but she doesn't see the end of it. She just, this is just the beginning of the provision that God's going to work in her life day in and day out and day in and day out all through the harvest season. And then at the end of that harvest season, there's even going to be more in store for her. She, do, she doesn't even know what's going on. As a matter of fact, she's in here, and what you, when you read the storyline, what you'll find out is that when she comes home with her, her you know, her day's wages. They were far more than day's wages. They were a year's wage. She had enough barley that day that she had beat out because of the handfuls of purpose that it would have been what you would have gathered out in the whole barley season. And when Naomi saw that, she knew something was up. She knew that she didn't just glean that around, that God had to be working in her life. And I want you to see that tonight as well as we work through the account that is here. The Redeemer reveals himself in this text. And remember, we're going to make a parallel between Boaz and Christ tonight. But, but we find here, Boaz is the Redeemer in this book. He is the predecessor of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the predecessor of David, uh, who is the predecessor of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greater David. But he is the Redeemer in this book. And this is a lesson for us to learn. It is a lesson that I tried to instill in you in the first message. And the first message that we preach was what? And that is the sin of unbelief. You have to take God at His word. And if you don't take God at His word, it will rob you of blessings. This woman, she had never been to Israel before. She, didn't, she was in a strange country. It was a strange people. She was a stranger in this place. But in the field of grace... Uh, through the words of her blessed Redeemer, she learned some things. And so, we also find in this text that the Redeemer is revealed. He is revealed to Ruth through His words and through His action. And that's the same way our blessed Lord is revealed to us. He is revealed to us through His words, the things that He tells us, and He's revealed by His actions, the things that He does for us. And this text exposes this to great light. It is through his words and action that, Bo, that Boaz, Boaz assures Ruth that she has found grace in his sight. And Ruth knows that grace has been extended to her. In verse 10 in our text it says, Then she fell on her face. She knew that she didn't deserve what was going on. You know, she had a response, if you will, to grace. And she realized that what was taking place for Boaz to have come from town and come out to see what's going on with his reapers and to greet them. I, it's interesting as you study this. I, there's so much here. I love what happens when Boaz comes to town. He says to his folks, he said, bless you. And they say, bless you. And there's great joy in the harvest season earlier up in this chapter. And everybody's blessing each other. And he says, who's that one over there? Oh, that's Ruth. She's been out here ever since early this morning. And he took notice of her, and he put his affection on her, and he says, you know what? I got some, something good for her. I've got something in store for her. I, I want her to stay with me. And so he approaches her and says, Ruth, 
guess what? You've, you landed in the right place. <laughs> this is the best place that you could land in. I'm going to take care of you all the way through the harvest season. You just listen to what I have to say. You listen to my words. You listen to what I say. And not only do you listen to what I say, but you stay close by my maidens. You know, there's a lot of maidens out there that you don't want to get next to, but you stay close to my maidens. Hey, and listen to that. You, my, my reapers, they're not going to hurt you. The guys here in the field, they're not going to come against you. They're going to be for you. They're going to be a protector for you. I'll give them instruction about that, and you'll be watered. You'll be well taken care of if you'll just listen to my words. That's what we're going to find in this story here, this account from God's Word. So first of all, let's look at some of these words that are found in this text. First of all, we find that there are words of identification. Words of identification in verse 8. It said, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? He poses as a question, but he calls her in this text... His daughter. His daughter. By nature, Ruth was a... Well, we already said it. She was a stranger. And by nature, she was a Moabitess. By nature, she did not deserve to be in this place. As a matter of fact, by nature, she was prohibited from being brought into this place. She was prohibited because the Moabites... They had uh, went against Israel in their wilderness wandering, and God had judged them because of that. And he made a prohibition, I won't develop it, but he made a prohibition on the Moabites to come into the land and for anybody to marry any of the Moabites. But in this text, you know, the blessed Redeemer, he has power over his law. He does have power over his law, and that'll be a lesson that we'll learn as you study the Bible, that there is a lawgiver, and the lawgiver can change his law if he wants to. He can supplement his law, say so the Lord changes his law. Well, of course he changes his law. Any of y'all, uh, last week, did y'all offer a lamb as a sacrifice anywhere? Did you? What about, did you have any bullets running around that you split their throat and, you also, and then you burn them up and use their ashes? Did you use those any time this year? Because God changed his law. God doesn't change, but he works different ways at different times because he's the master of the law. He's above the law in that sense. And so in our text, uh, however that works out in dispensationalism and however that works out in theology, the fact is, is that Ruth is grafted in through, through her husband and her husband's father into the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyway, by nature she's a stranger. And Boaz had every right under the law to call her a stranger. But he chose to call her, call her a daughter. And by grace she was a daughter. She was not a daughter by birth, but, but he claimed her as a daughter. And beloved, that's the way God is with us. He claims us as his own. He claims us as sons and daughters. This is a word of identification. Grace through faith makes us and claims us as the children of God. It was through faith that Ruth had come to Israel. Now you say, what is Israel? Well, Israel is the boundary of blessing. See, God had established a boundary. He established a nation. He gave them a land. He established the boundary of that nation. And inside that boundary was his promised blessing. It is called Canaan's fair and happy land. You know, it is a place that runs with, flows with milk and honey. And they did not always possess that land. And in the time that we find ourselves, we find ourselves in a very bad time. We find ourselves in the book of Judges. So I thought we was in the book of Ruth. Well, we are, but book of Ruth is tucked away in the book of Judges. And what is the book of Judges? It's a time when everybody did right in their own eyes. It was supposed to be a place of blessing, but it had become a place of cursing unless God in His mercy from time to time would bless them. And He had blessed them now. And she's in the place of blessing. She's in the boundary of blessing. And not only is she in the boundary of blessing, but she is also in the house of bread, which is what Bethlehem means. It is the house of bread. And so she finds herself in the boundary of blessing in the house of bread and she ends up in the field of grace, the very field that was in the possession of her blessed 
Redeemer, and he calls her a daughter. And so there are wonderful things that happen through the power of grace through faith. You know, if you go back to chapter 1 in Ruth, what you find is that Ruth gets to where she is by faith. Now, you put yourself in Ruth's shoes, if you will, for a moment, if you can, with me, and go, up, go back to Moab. Here you have a place of idolatry. They don't know the true and living God. I mean, they know of the true and living God, but they don't know the true and living God. And she's going to have to leave everything that she was brought up on. She's going to come away from mama and she's going to come away from daddy. Matter of fact, she confesses that that's exactly what she's going to do. And she does so based on the words about a better place. The, they had come into the country, chapter 1. They had heard in chapter 1. You read it. Now, this is a short look. Here's homework. So I got work tomorrow. That's all right. You got a lunch break. Yeah, here's your homework. You go home tonight, go tomorrow, something. read the book of Ruth. It's a real short book. And I want you to see in chapter 1 that they had heard that the famine was over. Someone, somehow a report got back over to Moab that God is blessing. There is bread in the house of bread. And you know what? Naomi says, well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back, girls, y'all on your own. You know, you go back to your mama and daddy. You go back to your nativity. You go back to the way you were. I'll tell you what, people out of the will of the Lord, they don't give good counsel. Huh? Naomi's out of the will of God. She doesn't give good counsel. She says, you just stay. But there was enough about the God of all grace that Ruth had heard that the Bible says in our text in chapter 1 and verse 16, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge, and thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord, she had heard about the Lord, Jehovah, the Lord, do so to me, and more also if aught but death part thee and me. So by faith she had gotten to this place. And it was the ground of faith that Boaz could claim her as a daughter. See, beloved, there are wonderful things that happen through the power of grace and faith. You know, after all, you no doubt have been taught and preached to that, you, that, that the salvation comes by grace through faith. And it didn't just happen in the New Testament. It happens here in the Old Testament. She is already a daughter of grace. She's already trusting in the true and living God. We find that right here in verse 11 of our text, Ruth 2.11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed to me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art, as present tense, art come to trust. Ruth was trusting in the God of Israel. She had abandoned her idolatry. She had abandoned the way that she was brought up. You know, her nationality didn't mean anything to her. She, she left that behind. She was going to have a new nationality. She was going to be grafted in to a wonderful place. And she embraced the God of heaven. And she was trusting in him. When we come to chapter 2, she is already trusting in the God of heaven. In that text, you read an expression. It says, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Now, does God have wings? You know, some child might read that and say, well, maybe God's got wings because it says... You come unto trust unto God unto whose wings you trust. God don't have wings. But his mercy seat does. See, the God of Israel has wings in this sense. That the mercy seat that he provides has wings because there are cherubs that have their wings outstretched in the holy place. And underneath those wings is where the blood of sacrifice is put on the Day of Atonement. And what he's saying is, is you have come to trust in the mercy of the living God where there is bloody sacrifice. And she believed all that by faith. She took God at his word. You know, God had given a word to Israel. And that, Israel had a, that word had a way for strangers to get in. 
And she's going to believe what is said about the way to get into this place and way to find mercy and the way to find grace. And she did. She took God at His word. Great things happen by grace through faith. Now, this is the same thing that happened later on over in the Gospels in Mark 5. I'll come right back here, but in Mark 5... The broken and the spent are claimed as daughters and sons by grace through faith. That is the way that we are claimed. We are nothing. We are like this woman, this Moabitess woman. We are like her when we fall down before, before, uh, before our blessed Redeemer and we say, Why have I found grace in thy sight? In the book of Mark chapter 5 in verse 24, in Mark 5 and verse 24, we read about a woman who has an issue of blood. And she spent everything she had on physicians that couldn't heal her. And she had heard about Jesus. And, and uh, if she could just touch, just touch the hem of his gar garment, she could be healed. And Jesus is going to do another work. He's going to Jairus' house to heal his daughter. And on the way, this woman's pressing, trying to get to Jesus. If I could just touch him, if I could just touch him. And she does. He says, who touched me? You read the text. Who touched me? And, you know, disciples, they're kind of, you know, they don't know too much. And so they say, what do you mean who touched you? Look at all these people around here. You, who do you mean who touched you? Like everybody's touching you. But everybody wasn't touching him by faith. Uh-huh. You see, there's a difference. And in the text, it says in verse 30, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about him in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched thee? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing, because he knew who touched him. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. In other words, I'm the one that did it. And I have an issue of blood. I'm not supposed to touch any man. She knew she was in trouble. The law, listen, beloved, the law would have had her put to death for what she did. But grace says... Did y'all catch that? See, law says she has an issue of blood. She ain't allowed to touch anybody. She's like the leper. You know, the leper had to go and say, unclean, unclean, unclean. Nobody's allowed to touch the leper. The leper is not allowed to touch anybody. And here this woman with the issue of blood, she's diseased. She's sequestered. She hadn't felt the touch of a man in many years. She doesn't know what love feels like. And she touches Jesus. And virtue leaves him and goes into her. And she's afraid. She knows something's changed. And she's afraid. But grace says, look at the text. Grace says, daughter. See, it's the same way. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. And be whole of thy pledge. See, grace is a wonderful thing. Grace through faith. That's how you get God's blessings. By grace through faith. You know, I mean, you know, if we had a Baptist battle cry, it'd be the book of Ephesians chapter 2, chapter two for by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Ruth knew that. Grace saves through faith in both testaments. It is one of those things that runs through all the Bible. By grace, through faith. It is by grace, through faith, that we are the children of God. In the book of Galatians chapter two, 3 and verse 26, Galatians 3, 26, we see that by, by faith, by grace and through faith, we're the children of God. 
Galatians 3.26, the scripture says there this truth. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Chapter 4 and verse 4, Galatians. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of the woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. We receive the benefit of being sons by the work of Christ. And we embrace that by faith. It is the channel by which grace is bestowed upon the believing sinner. And the blessed Redeemer identifies with us by this grace and through faith. And then not only do we find words of identification, but we also find words of instruction. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse 8 it says, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them, have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. In verse 21, the Bible says, And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Boaz gives Ruth careful, and I want you to get this tonight, careful instruction. Uh, excuse me. Boaz gives Ruth careful instruction in the field of grace. She's in the field of grace. She's getting instruction in the field of grace. And she receives a threefold instruction in this text. First of all, she is told to stay put. Secondly, she said to stay close. And thirdly, to stay focused. Those three things are laid out here in the field of grace by the blessed Redeemer. The blessed Redeemer, Boaz, tells Ruth, Ruth, you stay put. Don't you go in any other field. There is no other place that you're going to find what you need like, like you're going to find right here. You stay put. Secondly, I've got some folks I want you to stay close to. They're going to teach you what you need to know. They're going to provide for you what you need. You stay close to those folks. Don't go wandering here and go wandering there. You stay close to these ones in my field. And you stay focused. She says, look to the field. This is the field of grace. Remember that. Don't let that escape your mind as you think about this account before us. It is the field of God's blessing. It is the field of grace. It is the field, it is the field that she's going to be fed by. It is the field, beloved, that's going to restore her and her mother. It's going to meet their needs day in and day out all through the barley harvest. And not only then, but through the wheat harvest. And not only then, but it's going to bless her to be accounted as a, as a seed in the house of Israel. It's going to bless her through all eternity. Just to stay focused, to stay close, and to stay put. There's no else to glean. Stay put. No, oh, beloved, God's people need to get this lesson. This is the lesson of grace. God's grace is what you need. We preached about the continual need of grace. There is no other place that you're going to find grace but in the field of grace, staying close to the words of the blessed Redeemer and those, the provisions that He makes for us in the field of grace. Ephesians chapter 3, if we might apply this to this place. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible teaches us that we need to be rooted and grounded in God's love. You need to know why He loved you and how He loved you and how much He loved you and the extent to which He loved you and how He showed His love for you. And you find that not in the other field, but in the field of grace. Ephesians 3, in chapter, 14, or chapter 3, verse 14. It says, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sound like what Ruth, what Ruth did. She just fell on her face. 
In the context, he's talking about in the revelation of grace, and interesting, it's a very interesting in Ephesians chapter 3, he's talking about the revelation of grace to the Gentiles. How you like that? Like this old Moabitess woman. Here's the revelation of grace to the Gentiles, how they receive the blessing through the tribe of Israel, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he got here. And he said, I just bow, I just bow down and thank God for this. And then he says, For this cause I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, <coughs> that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Here it is. By faith. Say, so, well, I thought, the, I thought Christ is already in our heart by faith. You need more faith. See, you need more faith, you need more grace, you need more grace, you need more faith, and there is a continual supply nowhere else but as you listen to the words of the Lord and stay in the field of grace. Stay put. But let me get down to what I want to get to. Verse uh, 17 says, "...that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted..." <laughs> And grounded, I mean rooted, I, with that you got to take some roots in grace and you got to get grounded there and stabilize. That's what the word grounded means. Stabilize in, the, in, in this place of grace. And that you may be able, because this is, listen, let me just back up here. You've got to get rooted and grounded that you may be able to do something. You know, once you get rooted and grounded in grace then you're going to be able to comprehend some things. We talked about, I talked about some of this stuff at Ella Grove that just hit me from this text. You can know that which is eternal. You can know who, who is eternal. He who is eternal, you can know that. You can know the unknowable. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. You know where you're going to learn it? And know it in the field of grace. As you're rooted and built it up in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The field of grace is a wonderful place. It's like being planted in the house of God. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 92 tells us about being planted in the house of God. And you know what happens to people that are planted in the house of God? Well, they flourish. See, there is a place. In the Old Testament, it is a place of blessing, the, the boundary of blessing. It is also the house of bread, which is no doubt a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, first and foremost. But then you have the house of God that he established on this earth. You know, Jesus established a house while he was here. You can read it in the book of Hebrews. Moses had his house. Jesus has his house. Planted in his house. Too many people, too many of God's people are looking for grace in all the wrong places. You're not going to find grace in the world. What you'll find in the world is death. And I dare say Boaz says, I know some of these other fellows around here and they were in the boundary of blessing. But Boaz says, you're not going to find anybody like me around here. You're not going to find a field like my field. You're not going to find a place like my place. You're not going to find a people like my people. You're not going to find maidens like my maidens. You're not going to find servants like my for servants. Because see, where he is, <laughs> there the blessings flow. And where he is, his grace is in full supply. Where he is, and those that are listening to his word, and those that are obeying his word, and those that are being supplied this way when they're thirsty, they find all they need where they are in the field of grace. You're not going to find any love outside of Jesus Christ. There, nobody loves you. Listen, nobody loves you like Jesus Christ loves you. You're not going to find it anywhere else. But people look for love. They look for love in all the wrong places. I think that's some kind of song. I, don't, I remember hearing a long time ago when I was a little boy, looking for love in all the wrong places. It's true. But the songwriter, I don't know what, how the lyrics go because I don't listen to that junk, but I don't know how the lyrics go, but I know that the songwriter's probably talking about 
his wife looking for honey or whatever she was to him, looking for love all the wrong places but him. But I'm going to tell you what this story says, that we look for love in all the wrong places when we're not looking at Christ. You think the world's going to love you like Christ? No, the world's going to use you and abuse you and discard you. You need to stay, stay out of the world and stay in the field of grace. And then you're supposed to stay close to those in the field of grace. That's the second thing in this text. Because you need fellowship. And you know how you're going to grow in fellowship with the people that you fellowship with. If you fellowship with the world, guess what? You're going to grow in that kind of fellowship. You will. You need, listen, beloved, it is... It is necessary to vital church life that the people in a, an assembly of God, that they have an interrelationship with each other in the thing called fellowship. And of course, 1 John tells us that really our fellowship's in Christ and His Son, and Christ and the Father. So our fellowship's rooted in Him. But in the text, Boaz says, in the text, Verse 8, Hearest not, my daughter, go not to glean in another field, neither go from thence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Close by my maidens. You stay with them. We need to have fellowship. Fellowship is not a take it or leave it thing. You need fellowship with the people of God. I met a preacher one time, a long time ago, I guess about 20 years ago, and he stood in the pulpit, and he was, you know, he was, he was more sound than anybody else was sound, and he had every, you know, he knew every place everything was supposed to be crossed, and every dot that was supposed to be dotted, and he was just so, just right, and he's so full of himself, and he said, I don't need fellowship. Well, he's a liar, but you need fellowship. He lied against God's word. We need fellowship. You need it. This church needs it. So, well, Brother Shepherd, yeah, half of us, our family, we see each other all the time. I don't mean pick and choose who you're going to fellowship with. I don't mean, and I don't, know, I'm not, I don't know what goes on here. I don't live here. You know, you only know people when you live with them a while. I'm not your pastor. I don't live with you. And you don't live with me but I know how things go in churches because I've been in them all my life. I know how it works. You get clicks and this way and that way and these few people here like to fellowship with them because they like their stories more or whatever. But we need intimate fellowship with each other. Fellowship, encouragement, protection. Ruth needed to keep fast by Boaz's maiden and young men in the field of grace, day in and day out. Ruth's going to have an experience today, but tomorrow's going to be another day. You know, I say all this stuff happened in chapter 2 in one day, but guess what? She got up the next morning and went right back at it. And then she took some things home to Mama and said, Look how wonderful this is. Look at all this barley I got. She said, Bush, he is showing some favor to you. You better listen to what he has to say. And then she'd go back home and she said, look what, look what I got today. She's, she's happy. And all through the barley harvest, she's just excited. But you know why she's excited? Because she's staying close. And she's staying put. And then she has to stay focused. In our text it says... Verse 9, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. You know, it is interesting that her eyes aren't on the maidens, though she's right next to them. And her eyes aren't on the servants, though they're right there. The instruction is for her to stay, keep her eyes on the field. 
It says here in our text, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? You keep your eyes on what I have to supply for you, because after all, that's how we know of God's grace. You know, when we keep our eyes on, we keep our eyes on the provider, of course, of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see through His work, Through His work. I'll tell you what happens when you get your eyes on the other folks. Say, well, he ain't working as fast as he needs to be working. Uh, he, he ain't, she ain't doing what she, she's supposed to be over here. You know, as a matter of fact, in the text it says, it talks about Ruth in such a way that she was there early and she stayed late. You can read it in the text. She was a hard, diligent worker, and she did what Boaz said, and she was right there. You know, those other people, there are men, no doubt in this text, there are so people that were accustomed to what they were doing, they just, you know, kind of... But you get somebody who's new. Some of you folks have been around here a long time. And you, you know, I know how it gets. I know how it gets. It gets common. We get a have to mentality. Well, I have to. You know, preachers get the same thing. Because Sunday comes every week, and Wednesday comes every week, and revival meetings come, and the next day comes, and we have to. You think we always want to study? Now, I, you be you preachers, y'all, oh, we are honest. I'm going to be honest. We don't always want to study. Our backs hurt, our heads hurt. We get people, blah, 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 blah. They, people don't listen to what you say, and you say, I don't, what? But that's where we get in trouble, see. We take our eyes off the field and put it on the field hands. Listen, I don't care how great another preacher is. That I should never care about that. I have, but I shouldn't. Who cares? He didn't tell us to look at the preacher. He didn't tell us to look at the person sat in the pew. He says, you look at the field of grace. God's good to you. You look at what he supplied. And in doing so, you keep your eyes thereby on him. And you know what will happen? You'll find more grace. We're talking about a field of grace, right? James 4, and I must hurry on. James chapter 4. Do you know where you find more grace? I'll tell you what, if you're looking for me to find more grace, you're looking in the wrong place. I'm just trying to draw out some water for you tonight. Because you might be thirsty. I'm going to try to, but you're going to, but it, I'm, even there, I'm not going to give it to you. It's going to come out of the well. <laughs> and the well is where? The well's in the field of grace, too. I'm going to try to draw out a little water for you, for your thirsty souls. But you keep your eyes on the field of grace. Where are you going to get more grace? So, Brother Shepherd, we got grace. You need more grace. The book of James tells us that it's on the grounds of grace and through His grace and instructions of grace that we find more grace. In James 4 and verse 4 it says, Ye adulterers, adulterers, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit dwelleth in us, left us to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. In the field of grace, you find more grace as you humble yourself. Now Ruth could have gone back home that first day, and she could have said, you know, look at all I got. Mom, we got enough. We got enough for the whole year. Now you listen to this. We've got enough. 
say, that preacher's been preaching. He's been preaching almost an hour. We just about got enough. We got enough, Mama, for the whole year. But she didn't say that. As a matter of fact, she just says, look what I got. She don't even realize what she got. Naomi does. She's got, Naomi has come back from the place of curse to the place of blessing, and she's starting to see things again the right way. And she says, something's happened to you, Ruth. Somebody's taking some favor on you, Ruth. You better stay put. And she gives her some good godly instruction. She goes back out and works in the field of grace. What if she'd have just said, you know, this is enough. It's all I need. Now think with me for a minute. This is all I need. It would have run out. Her supply would have run out. Then she'd have found had to wait to another harvest time, another field. And she might have found something there, but it wouldn't have been what she had there. You think about that with me. No, God gives more grace. And I, did, I didn't read that. I didn't read that James out of context. And I, I'm not twisting the scripture. Who does he give more grace to? You think he gives more grace to the proud? Text says he doesn't. Can God's people be proud? Can they? Can a preacher be proud? Can church members be proud? Do you need more grace? He says, humble yourself. That's how you get more grace. And you know what the essence of humility is? The essence of humility is, is God, you're right. God, I'm going to hear your word. I'm going to do things your way. That's the essence of humility. Because... Otherwise, we're doing it our own way. I got it all figured out. I got it all figured out. I got it all planned out. And somebody might have been over in another field saying, Hey, Ruth, come over here. Look at all we got over here. Ruth said, I ain't listening to you folks. I got, I got a blessed Redeemer. He's got a field of grace. I'm going to stay right here and just keep on doing what he's told me to do. And she don't even know the end of the story yet. You know the end of the story. You have more revelation than Ruth has. You know how much book Ruth had? I don't even know if she'd seen the book yet. She'd heard about it. You know how much Ruth, you know how much book Ruth had? She had about, she had about that much in the book. If that much, she may never have seen the book. She just heard about the book. And heard about the God of the book. And heard the word of the God of the book. And come to rest under his wing. Trust in his mercy. Boy, she's going to stay there. Stay put. There's words of protection. She'd be protected in the field of grace. Because after all, the Lord is our shield. Not only does he shield us, but he told Abraham in Genesis 15, I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. His ways are ways of protection. Departure from him gives woe. That's what chapter 1's about. <coughs> chapter 2 is the way of blessing. And then finally, I close, there are words of provision. Boaz promised to refresh Ruth. You know, in the field of grace, there's work. You say, well, Brother Shepherd, you're talking about grace. I thought grace didn't have any work. Oh, yeah, grace has work. How do I know that? I just read the book of Ruth. 
You know what she did? She humbled herself and she was obedient in faith, believing her blessed Redeemer. And she went out every day to the field of grace and gleaned for what the God of all grace would give her through her blessed Redeemer. And she worked every day for it. That's the story of grace. Grace has rules. Grace has law. Grace would have us to live for our God. The grace of God teaches us not to live in lasciviousness. You know, uh, the whole New Testament is a book of the work of Christ. And Christ's law is a law of love. But you know what Jesus says? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do them. He uses both words. Keep means to guard, do means to do. And what if Ruth said, well, you know, this is the field of grace, and I, I'll just, I can look at all I got, I'll just keep on getting it. What would have happened to Ruth? I'll tell you what, she, she, what would happen to her, what happens to a lot of sovereign grace Baptists. She'd swivel up and die. That's what would happen to her. That's what happens to people who say, well, God's grace is, you know, listen, God is sovereign. God does work. God does supply. But I'll tell you what, whenever you get a good taste of God's grace, you're going to want to work for God, love God, and serve God. That's what happened to Ruth. And I'll tell you what, Ruth got something that not everybody in Israel got. I don't have time to preach on that. She got to be the bride of the Redeemer. There's a lot of folks in Israel that didn't get to be the bride of the Redeemer. They were in the place of blessing. They were eating from his hand, from the bread that he gave, but they weren't his bride. Now there's something in there too. Provision. Labor is great. But he says in verse 9, that's all right, I got some servants. When you get tired of working in the field, you just go get you some water out of my well and drink it up and you'll be refreshed. And then you know what you'll do? You'll be able to go back and work. Now there's some analogies. that This, this place here is a place for this man here to draw out from the well of God's grace and to give you something to drink from His Word, because the water is the Word of God. You've got to get to the well and get into that water source and get out of this thing what you need. Provision. And in this text, you find that Boaz practices fellowship. He sits down with her and eats. In the text. And then finally you find that Boaz provides more for Ruth than she realizes. He tells his laborers, he said, his gleaners, he said, now listen guys, when y'all go out there and y'all getting out my grace, make sure you give some extra grace to Ruth. It's called handfuls of purpose. In other words, it was given on purpose. Otherwise, she's got to scrounge around to find it. You know, it's the duty of the man of God to give out this bread. It is. So they don't have to scrounge around to find it. Listen, beloved, this man right here is duty-bound to give you grace from the Word of God. Now, I'm not talking about infusing grace in you like Roman Catholics try to do through baptism or through the Eucharist or something like that. I'm talking about taking the Word of God and feeding the people of God. To refresh them. Handfuls of purpose. On purpose. I'll tell you what, Ruth didn't even know what happened to her. I'm closing. Ruth didn't know what happened to her. But I'll tell you what, there was a seasoned saint that knew what happened to her. 
Oh, mama-in-law said, Ruth, what just happened to you was grace. And Ruth says, really? Oh, yeah, you go back in the field there, Ruth. And she does. The Lord identifies with us. He instructs us. He protects us. And He has great provision for us. But it's all found in the field of grace. You will rob yourself of blessings if you don't stay put and stay focused and stay close. You will rob yourself of blessings if you don't humble yourself before your God and say, God, I need more grace. That's who he gives grace to. You know, after all, in the book of Hebrews, it's called what? Chapter 4, the throne of grace. And what do you find when you go to the throne of grace? You find mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. But what happens if you don't go to the throne of grace? This is practical. What happens if you don't go to the throne of grace? Well, you don't get more mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. That's why people run. That's why Christians run around just, I mean, with their heads chopped off, like, you know, don't know what, which end to turn because they don't go to the throne of grace to say, Lord, I need some more grace. I need some help. No, we say, I got this, I got this, I got this, I got this. And then they lose out. May God help us. He's the only one that can. And may we stay in the field of grace. And stay focused on the field of grace. Stay close to his maidens and his laborers. And learn how to labor in the field of grace. God will bless you. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray.